The history of speculative fiction is wide and deep, and contrary to the way its history is often discussed, it was never creatively the sole bastion of white male writers. As we'll see, black writers were exploring stories and themes consistent with what would eventually be termed speculative fiction many years before even the old pulp magazines existed. Hello everyone and welcome back to SFF 180. Thomas here, your host as always. Thank you for joining me. It should be obvious that no group of people is marginalized as their natural state. Marginalization is something done to people anytime a power structure develops around something new and emerging into the culture. Consider the early silent days of cinema. There were women filmmakers and black filmmakers working right alongside the earliest giants of the field. Oscar Michaud wrote and directed The Homesteader, the first feature film with an all-black cast and crew, in 1919. And in 1922, Tressie Souters, believed by many to be the first black woman feature filmmaker, directed A Woman's Error. But the silent films of black filmmakers existed outside of the emerging studio system, they very rarely crossed over to white audiences, and most were soon forgotten. Today, about 80% of them are thought to be lost. Once science fiction became an established niche in commercial publishing in the early 20th century, it took some time for black voices to be heard. And that was deliberate. John W. Campbell was a notorious racist who once famously rejected a story by the young Samuel R. Delaney on the grounds that readers would not be able to relate to a black protagonist. Delaney went on to publish that story elsewhere. It was a little book called Nova. There's also a letter Campbell wrote to horror writer Dean Kuntz proclaiming that a technologically advanced black civilization was, and I quote, a social and biological impossibility. Of course, Campbell believed in a perpetual motion machine, so he wasn't all that gifted a prophet of the future, despite the outsized influence he had on the genre's artistic development for decades. In this video, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the early black storytellers who helped shape the course of speculative fiction. Now, while this won't be an exhaustive list, hopefully it will show that these voices have always been with us and their words fell upon fertile soil. Martin Delaney was a remarkable figure. Born a free man in Virginia in 1812, he became both a doctor, being one of the first three black men admitted, however briefly, to Harvard Medical School, and a journalist who edited a black newspaper called the North Star with Frederick Douglass. He was a militant abolitionist and a proponent of black nationalism, and even spent a year leading an expedition to West Africa, looking into the possibility of resettling emancipated black American slaves there. Delaney even signed a treaty for this with eight chiefs in the region, but when the Civil War began, he chose to stay in the United States, where the Union made him a major and tasked him with helping recruit former slaves to fight for them against the South. In 1859, Delaney serialized a novel, Blake, or The Huts of America, said to be the first published novel by a black author in the United States. The book was inspired by the slave insurrection panic of 1856 and the 1857 Dred Scott decision, which stripped all black people, slave or free, of citizenship rights. The book's protagonist is a man you might say was patterned a bit after Delaney himself, and the story follows Henry Blake's quest to locate his wife Maggie, who has been sold off by her owner. It's a quest which takes him throughout the South, where he spreads the message of revolution among plantation slaves and leads many of them to freedom in Canada. Blake's adventures eventually take him to Africa, where he leads an unsuccessful Amistad-like mutiny of a slave ship, and then eventually to Cuba, where he reunites with his wife at last and joins his cousin Placido in a revolt against Spanish rule. Blake's eventual goal following the revolution is to resettle American slaves in Cuba. Unfortunately, the ending of the story is either lost or was never published. So we have no idea if the revolution ever took off, let alone if everybody ended up happily ever after in Cuba, enjoying excellent cigars and beautiful Caribbean sunsets. I suppose we can let our own headcanons fill in those gaps. The novel was in some ways written as a response to Harriet Beecher Stowe's very popular Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
which Delaney very much disliked for the complacency of its slave characters. And it stands as an early example of speculative fiction by the way it not only anticipates a violent overthrow of the system of slavery prior to the Civil War itself, indeed Delaney's entire point is that violent revolt is the only appropriate way to overthrow such a system, but also in how Delaney plays around with the actual timeline of real-life events to suit his plot. Samuel R. Delaney, no relation, would later describe Blake as being, quote, about as close to an SF-style alternate history as you can get. Sutton Griggs was an author and Baptist minister who also explored the concept of black nationalism in his 1899 novel Imperium and Imperio, about an underground government of black Americans with its own Congress meeting in secret in, of all places, a hidden compound in Waco. The Imperium, under the leadership of the charismatic and Harvard-educated Bernard Belgrave, plans to use the cover of the Spanish-American War to declare its own war against the U.S. and found an independent black nation by taking over Texas. But Bernard's childhood friend and vice president, Belton Piedmont, opposes this idea because, like Griggs himself, he's a pacifist who believes that peaceful integration into the United States is possible. Belton, in a rather shocking turn, is executed for betraying the Imperium, much to the dismay of its other members, who reach the conclusion that Bernard has gone insane, and the Imperium must therefore be dissolved and exposed as, quote, a serious menace to the peace of the world. Now, Griggs self-published his book and sold it in fairly low numbers at revival meetings, but in the 21st century, Imperium and Imperio has, along with four other novels, by Sutton Griggs undergone an academic and critical reappraisal. Also in 1899, Charles W. Chestnut published The Conjure Woman, a collection of folkloric hoodoo stories that was widely read and well-reviewed, and is today considered a seminal work of African-American literature. It's a collection of seven stories, all narrated by the very memorable Uncle Julius McAdoo, patterned after Uncle Remus. A former plantation slave, Uncle Julius regales, in his thick dialect, a somewhat awestruck northern white couple who have come south for the sake of the wife's health, hoping to own a vineyard, with stories of magic spells and charms and haints, like The Gooford Grapevine and Hotfoot Hannibal. The book was so popular that in 1926 it was made into a silent movie by, you guessed it, Oscar Michaud, although sadly the movie is lost. The book is available to read online, just be aware that Uncle Julius's narration contains about a million uses of the N-word. At this point you might be asking, weren't any black women writing? And the answer is absolutely. Born in 1825, Frances Harper was considered the prominent African-American poet, publishing her first poetry collection, Autumn Leaves, when she was 20. And her short story, Two Offers, published in the same Anglo-African magazine that published Blake, was the first short story, the first short story, published in America by a black woman. Harper was very active as an abolitionist, helping numerous escaped slaves through the Underground Railroad. Her 1892 novel, Eola Leroy, or Shadows Uplifted, is the story of a young mixed-race woman raised to believe she's white until one day she and her mother are sold into slavery. Eola decides to fully embrace her African heritage and becomes a passionate advocate for the improvement of black society. The story's overall sense of optimism and hope, envisioning true equality between black and white citizens, has led the book to be described as the earliest example, known example, of black utopian fiction. Also writing around this time was Pauline Hopkins, editor of the Colored American magazine, which ran from 1900 to 1909, and has something of an eventful history all its own. Especially when Ms. Hopkins was forced out of the editor's chair for being too outspoken on racial issues by none other than Booker T. Washington, who it appears had a wealthy white friend who had invested in the magazine. All that drama aside, in 1902, the magazine serialized Pauline Hopkins' novel Of One Blood, which is full of ghosts and mysticism and magic and all kinds of fun pulpy stuff, and then it levels up into a full-on lost civilization novel, as its hero, Ruel Briggs, a lonely and morose 
mixed-race medical student with no particular interest in his own heritage, finds himself on an African expedition, mostly for the loot. But after being kidnapped, because of course that has to happen, Ruel finds himself in the hidden city of Telesar. Action and treachery ensues, with Ruel eventually coming into an appreciation of his heritage at last, and ascending to the throne of Telesar. Uh, the story has a whole lot of romantic complications that sound a bit over the top, but it also has secret passages and treasure rooms full of booby traps, and you certainly can't go wrong with any of that stuff. Finally, I can't wrap up without mentioning two early stories that bring us as close as we can probably come to looking like modern science fiction. Edward A. Johnson was an attorney who became the first African American on the New York State Legislature. In 1904, Johnson published a very accessible short novel called Light Ahead for the Negro, whose narrator is enjoying a pleasant ride in an airship one day when there's a horrible accident and he's knocked out. He awakens in Georgia, of all places, in the year 2006, where racism is a thing of the past. Wishful thinking, to put it mildly, but of course Johnson is pursuing a message here. As he says in the introduction to his book, Johnson believed racial disharmony, quote, can be solved in peace and goodwill, rather than by brutality. And the story is his attempt to depict a future where this ideal has been achieved. Finally, I can't sign off without mentioning W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the most illustrious African-American public figures of the first half of the 20th century, one of the founders of the NAACP, and the author of such essential historical works as The Souls of Black Folk and Black Reconstruction in America. In 1920, Dubois published The Comet, a haunting and still pretty effective post-apocalyptic short story in which the tale of a comet passes over New York City and kills everybody, except Jim Davis, a black man, and a wealthy young white woman named Julia. It looks as if death might be the great leveler after all, but the ending... Well, let's just say Dubois wasn't confident even the possible end of humanity would cure us of our racial divides. So, as I said at the beginning, this was far from a comprehensive list. The early 20th century also saw a number of African writers publishing mythic and magical realist stories. But these were some of the black authors in the United States whose formative work laid an important foundation in speculative fiction, however slowly the commercial SF publishing field was to welcome black voices as the 20th century progressed. Anyway, that's all I have time for this episode. I want to thank you all for joining me, and if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and please subscribe if you have not done so. We're very, very close to 8,000 subs. This is how the channel grows, and I appreciate that support. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's Army get little perks like early access to some of my videos. I use my Patreon money to mainly pay my channel artist, who does all my lovely thumbnails for me, so that help is very much appreciated. I want to thank the rest of you guys for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube, and until I see all of you next time, remember, Black Lives Matter, and so do black words. Thank you, be safe, happy reading.